Hello everyone, welcome to Thursday Night Appetizer. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes, we're back. It is, oh, what's the date today? The 13th of January. Feast of St. Hilary. Feast, Feast of St. Hilary. Okay. Um, yeah, I like, to, I like to think I know what, I know how my mom felt 43 years ago today. Probably pretty terrible. Because she was about to give birth. She was about to give birth to me. Her first. Her first. Yeah. Yeah, tomorrow's my birthday. Happy birthday to me. Um, I have to say it on here because like nobody remembers because it's so close to Christmas. Like I won't, you know, I won't get any phone calls or anything. My siblings will all forget, probably. Um, anyway, I'm here with Deacon Charles, one of my only friends. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking how pathetic you sounded, Sam. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> it actually reminds me of the gospel we're going to look at today. Mm. Um, yeah, which is about wine, but it's also about joy. And how many things in life can like rob us of, of joy? Mm. And that's one side. And the other side is, uh, what what does God want to offer, offer specifically? Let's say, what does Jesus want to offer us as we're going through life and often being robbed of joy or robbing ourselves of joy? Um, All right. Yeah. Cool. Like, what's joyful in life right now? Good question. Hmm. Can you back up a little bit? You're scaring me. There you go. Okay. Your head should be around roughly the same size as mine. Thank you. For We need a director. We need a cinematographer. We need... We need a producer. A producer. Yeah, that's that's what we need for anyone a out podcast. there who's a producer. No, I'm just we. I wouldn't be able to work with a producer, so let's just forget about it. Um, okay, so we got a couple things to tell you about. So we, last week we uh, talked, we touched on Unify, but uh, we actually have come up with a theme for Unify mm-hmm. for the 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 series that is about to begin on the twenty first, which is you will be found. The sub the sub theme is. Have you ever felt lost? Have you ever felt alone? Jesus is searching for you. You will be found, but not in a creepy way. That's, that's the small print. That's the small print. And uh, it's great to have a theme again because the theme sort of lays the foundation for the four-part letting God's word soak into your heart, beginning with the backgrounder on Tuesdays, the Thursday night appetizer, which you're watching now, Unify, our worship service, which begins again next week on Friday, the 21st. And of course, the small group, small discussion groups are still meeting. And you can take what you learn here on a Thursday Night Appetizer and in the backgrounder and talk to a friend. Bring it up with somebody that you know. Uh, it's very easy to get, you know, uh, to, to help let that word soak into people's hearts um, in your own life as well. And also always make sure you have uh, this, this episode brought to you by Fisherman's Friend. Improving your love life since... 1902. I'm just guessing. It says established, but then there's no... Oh, 1865. Wow. Yeah. Black Um, licorice. We had to come back to that. That was actually... Some people mentioned that was their favorite part of the last show, so... I know it wasn't as funny this time, but I'm going to have another piece. I think if you tell... It worked so good for me last week. A joke over and over and over again, Mm -hmm. it gets less and less funny each time, except to you if you're telling it. Yeah. Then it's even funnier. Oh, I know. And, And the fact that people are annoyed... Nobody anyway. told me they were annoyed. Well, they, they will eventually get tired of it if you tell yeah. it over and over again. Oh, that's the whole idea, right? Yeah. Um, we also have a, a program starting for men, uh, especially if you if you know, which I think all of us knew at some level, that we are, are slaves to sin and that we know God wants to set us free from sin, that uh, we have a program starting called Morning Watchmen. And this Sunday, we're going to start to gather together a few guys. I think we have... Eight or ten guys who are interested this year. This is their fourth year running. Previously, we used a program called Exodus 90, which I've been part of for about four years ago. Sam's been help, helping run it. So it's a program which is like, I would call it like a deep cleanse spiritually, um, allowing the Holy Spirit to come into our hearts, taking on practices like cold showers daily, extra time of prayer, um, sacrificing, fasting, those kinds of practices that Jesus says are going to help cleanse us and allow us to be free from sin and free to, to live the life he wants us to live. Great. Yeah. 
Um, pretty exciting to be starting that again. Sort of. Yeah. Challenging sort of, too, Sort right? of terrified too. But, yeah. Um, and yeah, um, if you are interested in that, uh, you should let me know very soon. Um, contact info all over our website. And the reason is we are actually meeting on Sunday Tuesday. night at 8 o'clock. Sunday night. So for anybody who's interested, uh, we need you to show up Thursday night, Sunday night at 8 o'clock, get your materials, join the fraternity, find an anchor, all those kind of fun things. And find out what it's all about. And find out what it's all about. And yeah, um, there's lots of information on the website already. I actually uploaded all of the stuff we're going to give you on the weekend. So yeah. And we are heading into one of my favorite uh, passages from the gospel this coming Sunday. I'll be preaching at Holy Family as well. But uh, this is our chance to reflect on a passage from John chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, which is often called the Wedding Feast of Cana, Wedding Feast of Cana, the miracle where Jesus turns water into wine. One of the most famous things that Jesus did, besides the most important thing he did, dying on the cross, rising from the dead, people often know about this miracle. He turned water into wine. What the heck? Anyway. Let's get into the background, or Sam, if that's okay. You bet. I was very enthusiastic. I'm not that enthusiastic today. I'm enthusiastic because um, time is short. Lending wings to our... Lending wings game. to our background or discussion All right. here. Okay. Water into wine. So think about water as one of God's greatest gifts. Pretty obviously. We need water just to live. In fact, most of our bodies are made of water. I think two-thirds of the human body is water, something like that. Two-thirds of the surface of the earth is covered with water. Um, nothing more refreshing than a cup of water on a, on a hot day, cold water on a hot day, like if you've been working really hard in the sun, hiking, whatever. Um, a shower or bath can be like really reviving and cleansing, obviously. And water is found throughout the Bible, from the creation of the world till um, the passage where we hear about Jesus being baptized in the Jordan. Water's all through. Um, when you become a Christian, Besides accepting Jesus in faith, we're baptized into Christ with water, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I think water also represents all of our body's deepest needs, even our deepest desires. We see that someone thirsts when they want more and more of whatever is dearest to them. Maybe you thirsted for companionship when you felt really alone, friendship. Uh, it could be a, a thirst for healing. You really need to be healed because you're dealing with pain or failing in mind, body, or spirit. For what do you thirst is a, is a great question for any one of us. Um, God places these desires in our hearts. God has made us so we need the good things of creation. It's really good to receive the things that we need, but often not everything we need, we desire or need is good for us uh, because of the way we, we use and consume those things. The, the reality is we're sinners, which means we're apt to seek out things in a destructive way. How often have you desired and sought out things that are harmful? We call this sin. But our desire for earthly things, from water to all the things we look for, all the things we need, will never leave us, leave us satisfied. We want more, much more. A cup of water, in a, cold water on a hot day, a couple hours later, you know, more water, whatever it may be. We're always looking for more. God has placed desires in our heart, but the deepest desire of all is our thirst for God himself. So this miracle take, uh, takes place at this wedding. There's a newly married couple and their guests. And they could have gotten by with just water to drink when they ran out of wine. They would have gotten by. Something would be missing. So the very first miracle Jesus ever did answered their need. The joy of the celebration was restored when the water in the jugs, which were there for cleansing, was turned into wine for celebration. This miracle where Jesus turned water into wine is the beginning of his signs. The first time he began to point to himself so that his disciples began to believe in him. Jesus wants to fulfill your deepest desire for him by inviting you to receive him into your heart. The wine of the miracle is a sample of the incredible joy that only he can give us, the joy that carries us through all of life's ups and downs until we are finally home with him in heaven. And that's our background for this week. Wonderful. Okay, um, I will... Uh, lead us in a prayer, and uh, then we'll continue with the, the gospel reading for Sunday. Thank you. Your Father and Son, Holy Spirit, amen. God, our Father, we praise and thank you for this day, and we are so, so thankful, Lord, that you're present in our lives, that uh, you reach down from your throne 
uh, to become one of us, to send your son Jesus to die for us, to enter our world. So many of us right now, um, I know Charles and I included, are you know, struggling to make sense of what's going on around us in the world and uh, just sort of the chaos that, that uh, meets us each day. And oftentimes we don't know where to turn, but we know we can always turn to you. You are the answer. You are uh, the source of all life and all goodness. And uh, I just pray that you'd remind us to keep our eyes focused on you in all things, especially in the hard things that we face. And we ask you, Lord, to unlock and open this passage to us and allow us to receive the graces of your Holy Spirit as we ponder, as we listen to the Holy Spirit, and as we read the scripture passage. We pray that you would be glorified in our conversation today. We pray for blessings and graces upon all of our listeners. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. On to the reading. There was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples were also invited to the wedding. When the wine ran short, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, how does your concern affect me? My hour is not yet come. His mother said to the servers, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for, Jew for Jewish ceremonial washings, each holding 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus told them, Fill the jars with water. So they filled them to the brim. Then he told them, Draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it. And when the head waiter tasted the water that had become wine, without knowing where it came from, although the servers who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely an inferior one, but you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this as the beginning of his signs at Cana of Galilee, and so revealed his glory, and his disciples began to believe in him. I'm just going to start, if that's okay, Sam. I was just thinking about the mother of Jesus. You know, her name is Mary from, from Luke and Matthew. Um, what's really interesting to me is how close she obviously is to Jesus, but at the same time, her attention is focused on the people around her. That's a really interesting combination. Um, the thing she says, they have no wine. She's noticing the people out there. And then do whatever they, uh, do whatever they tell you. Do whatever he tells you. I'm sorry. She says that directed to to the the people who are there, the the servants at the at the wedding feast. But it's obviously based like whatever she says is is based on this like really close relationship with Jesus. I guess the closest human relationship that he would have had, and we believe still has. Um, and what I like about her, the conversation with Jesus, the, the back and forth is not uh, not sentimental mm -hmm. it's kind of i don't know it's kind of, okay goofy term from a few years ago it's like kind of salty salty well it's like <laughs> she ignores him he ignores her they have yeah. no wine he just says my hour is not yet come which is a bit really big deal which you can talk more about in a minute but just, just she kind it. of just goes anyway and yeah tells, just do whatever uh, he tells you yeah like i just 
what I, what I like about both of them, really, but I'm focusing on her for now, is like, they just seem so real. Like that phrase, the real deal, comes to my mind. Mm -hmm. It's like, Mary is the real deal. She's not, I have plaster statues of Mary at home, but she's not a plaster statue. She's a real person mm -hmm. who lived probably kind of a you know, ordinary hard life of, of that time. Um, and she has an ordinary relationship with Jesus, who is her son, born of her. At the same time, she knows his divinity, who he really is, more deeply than anyone. And she doesn't fully understand it. I'm, I'm sure she doesn't fully understand it, but she knows more deeply than anyone, which is why, for the first time ever, at her intercession, her request, he's going to do a miracle. And it's a crazy miracle, too. So I like all that. I like that about her. I like them. I like them both. Mary and Jesus. There you go. I'm a Christian. I there like you go. Mary Deacon Jesus. Charles likes Mary and Jesus. There's uh, the revelation of the day. I just think they're like... The way she relates to Jesus is just wonderful. And I really feel like I, I aspire to have that kind of relationship with him with my, myself. It's like being really close, but my attention is focused on other people. And it's, it's just like kind of almost comical back and forth. But really it's about doing what he would want, but playing a role somehow in by asking him for things that I can't do, she can't do for him. She can't do for others, I should say, that she knows he can do. It's like, okay, come on, Jesus. Mm -hmm. They have no wine. I, I like that too. And uh, that was something I was going to point out as well. She actually kind of reminds me of my own mother mm -hmm. in this, this scene. Mm -hmm. And also my wife uh, as a mother. Yep. Um, when, you know, I've, I've seen this play out actually in real life mm -hmm. where you, the mother like suggests something and mm -hmm. you're like, nah, or you know, whatever. And then she goes and like sets it up, you know, um, you know, like, hey, why don't you go and work for uh, so and so? Or ask so and so for a job. No, I don't really want to. Or, yeah, I don't feel like it. Then she like goes and does it for for you anyway. Cause she knows what would be best for you, right? It's almost like, um, I, you know, like your mother in a way knows you better than you know yourself at times. She knows things about you that you don't know about yourself. She knew, yeah, she recognizes things about you that you don't you don't not necessarily yeah. recognize, and it. I don't know, you see it playing out in this scene. Like, I don't know if she knows more about Jesus than he knows about himself. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's theologically correct. But but at the same time, she understands something about her role in that situation that maybe he didn't immediately or something. But, but I, don't know. I, I think I've got something, which is that she was his mother and no one else was. He was not his own mother. Yeah, It's not some weird phenomenon. It was a miraculous coming to be coming to be within her, but she was the only person who experienced being his mother. Yeah. And that's absolutely unique. But that's true of each one of us, too. I, obviously, I mean, that's the point. I was thinking about something my family asked me to do, not specifically my mom, my mom and dad. I've had two uncles who died in the last few years, and they asked me to preach my uncle's funeral, which I was very honored to be asked to do. Mm -hmm. But I would not have asked. I would not have offered but when I was asked, it was like, okay, well, that's something I can do for my family because because my, my mom and dad asked me to. Mm -hmm. And I would say that even, and I know this is true of Jesus, and this is true of me as a father with my kids and vice versa. It's like, even though you might feel misunderstood or not fully understood by your mother or father, they still see things and know things about you that you don't know about yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I was thinking about wine and mm -hmm. water, like you, uh, the you background. Kind of, yeah, yeah, you kind of brought it up. Yep. Um, a little, you talked about water a lot. Yep. In the backgrounder, but, um, uh, I was thinking about it, like I have kept the good wine until now. And, uh, what I, what I like about this parable about the, the idea of water being turned into wine is, mm -hmm. um, or this just kind of, I think there's maybe two things. I might think of a third one as I talk, but go ahead. The, the first one is um, this, this miracle, his first miracle almost seems frivolous. Yes. I mean, compared to some of the other ones where like someone's life was on the line or like, you know, like, heal, like healing the leper, you mm -hmm. know, the guy's, it was a dramatic, dramatic change in that person's life. Right. These people probably woke up in the morning, <laughs> uh, Maybe they remembered how good the wine was. Eh, maybe they were just like, okay, the party's over, like time to clean up, you know? Yeah. Like it, it was, it's in terms of like its impact, it's 
probably the least of all of his miracles, right? Yeah. Maybe other than like the fig tree one, but anyway. Um, so it seems almost frivolous, but I think, I think sim it's symbolic of something, you know? Um, the idea that water is something pretty ordinary. Yes, we use it for washing, we use it for cleaning. Mm. It's, it's very commonplace. Wine is something entirely different, even though chemically, wine and water are extremely similar, right? Um, I, I have a little bit of a chemistry background, not too much, but I love chemistry. Love, I still love chemistry and physics. And uh, just molecularly, water and wine are extremely similar, right? This there's, carbon and wine, that's there's a lot the difference, of, right? There's a lot of water in wine. Let's of course. put it that way. Sure, okay? sure, it's, sure. It's, that makes sense. It's like you said about the human body. It's like yeah. wine, wine is probably like a, you know, a huge percentage water. You know? I think it's like... 12 15 percent alcohol it does have a carb it has that ethanol in it yeah um nope sorry about that um but uh really like wine is something entirely different you know mm -hmm. wine is almost like um like royal water mm -hmm. in a way it's kind of like uh or heavenly water heavenly water. water yeah it's like sublime compared sure, to water sure. you know they're totally a different thing and um Taking the ordinary and making it extraordinary is like what God does. Mm -hmm. I think is, you know, I, I think of like some of the ordinary things in my life um, that God has made extraordinary, you know. Um, I, th I just think Jesus does that in a lot of ways. I'm going to mention something that just took place. We had a couple of friends visit, mm -hmm. Nikki and Claire. Mm -hmm. Right now I can hear them. They're in the church singing and praising God. Mm -hmm. It's pretty ordinary. Okay. But it's not. Yeah. It's pretty extraordinary. We we're just talking about that. It's like Yeah, given like who they are. Yeah, and yeah. They're how amazing uh, they are. And and the fact that we we have um friendship, um, we're kind of journeying together, um in, in each in our own way in that. But it's like people who are willing to share their faith with us, who 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 share share the faith that we we have to offer with them and and just like we should never underestimate these ordinary people that God places in our lives. And I would say take them for granted, which we do. Uh, and I think actually celebrating the people in our lives seems to be part of this miracle too. It's like, well, I mean, who really cares about this one ordinary couple in the village of Cana? <laughs> A few miles, I guess. I don't know how many miles from where Jesus and Mary were uh, in Nazareth. They're just ordinary people. So what if their wedding ends up short of wine? Probably happened every now and then. It was a bit of a disaster for them, but in the grand scheme of things, who cares? But I guess it turns out Jesus cares and Mary cares. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it kind of it just inspires me to think about other ordinary people in our lives besides our friends Nikki and Claire who just pop by to say hello um, and how amazing it is to know that we can, I, I say, celebrate people and celebrate with people. Um, I've been thinking a lot about friendship and in this gospel from which we're drawing John chapter 2. Later on, Jesus will say to the disciples, they just began to believe in this miracle, it says. Towards the end of their journey, he says, I'm calling you servants no longer. I'm calling you friends. And friendship, well, Jesus doesn't need servants, but he certainly doesn't need friends. I mean, Jesus is one with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit, and they're like pure love, pure joy. But he wants our friendship, and he wants to share his friendship with us. Mm -hmm. And that's like way beyond. That's not just like you're saved from hell. That's a big deal not to be not to go to hell, obviously. But God wants so much more for us, and Jesus shows that to us. This, this wine, this this divine friendship, mm -hmm. lifting up the ordinary into the extraordinary. Yeah, like God, yeah, God cares, and also that God cares about the little things in our lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's one of my, one of my favorite things to tell people, I think, like just in, in my work and stuff. Yeah, like what? Like youth ministry and things like that. Sorry, what's an example? What, what, what's like, my favorite thing? One of the little things that, that God lifts up, is that what you're saying? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I love telling them that God cares about the little things in your life. Like he, he cares that, I don't know, that you had a bad sleep last night, or that, uh, you aren't getting along with a friend or like he actually cares about those things. Not, not that like, he's not like, like parents sometimes are, we're like, Oh yeah, that's nice. You know, 
or, or whatever. Like he actually cares. He actually cared about this couple, right? Mm -hmm. um, and their situation. He cares about marriage. He cares about the relationships between them and their friends, which would have been, um, I gather, damaged by the fact that they ran out of wine. I mean, that would have been incredibly well, embarrassing or whatever. Yeah. But it seems like a small thing, but to God, there really aren't any small things. And he really does see the whole person. He sees all of us and he cares about all of us. Mm -hmm. I, I just, uh, to me, it's like a reminder that like, he's not just, it's not like he doesn't have time for you and your little, seemingly little things. Mm -hmm. He does. Right. Right. And I, I that... love that about God. Like that's yeah. one of the reasons I'm still a Christian is because right. God cares about me and my little things as well as the big things. And clearly Mary presented here as the person closest to Jesus in the scene. Mm -hmm. Because she's so close to him, she, she shares that perspective. She has the same kind of heart of like paying attention to the little things and that attention to detail of what matters to someone else, even if it doesn't actually matter to me, is a sign of like... I think I heard the, heard the word once, just kind of a, a term describe, describing saints as having a kind of exquisite courtesy for people who are down and out. Mm -hmm. Because the thing about people who are down and out is they're basically faceless. People walk by them all the time and don't even notice them. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just remembering when I was a kid, I came from a very poor city. I come from a very poor city. Um, People literally were begging on the streets. It was very common, a bit like going to Toronto, actually, or even downtown Kitchener or something. Um, but it was very common there. And it's like, almost like you just, I just have this memory, not in a bad way. It was like, here's some change, put it, put, you know, put it in that person's whatever pouch or basket they had and just keep on moving. Right. Um, but how much more significant it is when you actually notice the person, not just as someone in need, but as a person and actually encounter that person and just like get to know them well enough to say like the little things about your life now matter to me because you matter to me. Um, I mean, it's pretty amazing. I think it also brings joy to us when we do that for sure. I, I just thought of a great example. Yeah. Um, I just saw a part of this story and uh, my sister-in-law was kind of filled me in on the, on some of the, mm -hmm. they did I uh, forget where, where this, I think this experiment took place in Washington, DC. It was a social experiment. There's a, there a famous uh, violinist who played a sold-out show in some giant opera house. Mm -hmm. $100 a ticket, completely sold out, you know, huge budget. Um, he owns a Stradivarius violin worth $1.5 million. <clears throat> He's one of the best violinists in the world. And uh, as a social experiment, they got him to play, to busk in a subway station. So he was in a subway station playing one of the most difficult violin songs on the like to play one mm -hmm. of like it only the very hot top one percent of people of violinists can actually play the song and he was playing on a one and a half million dollar violin and he had just played an enormous show completely sold out at a hundred dollars a ticket and he made he made ten, he played for three hours in the subway and made something like ten dollars and 34 cents <laughs> the like the the moral of the story is um like like you were saying sometimes people become invisible just because of this sort of the their surroundings or the situation right. they're in right and like you said the saints and christians are called to see the invisible people not to not to overlook them um and i would say i would say also that jesus to jesus you're always it's like you're always on the stage mm-hmm and you're always, he's always proud of what you're doing, always very interested in what you're doing, um, regardless of your situation. He's like your biggest fan, right? If you think of it that way. Yeah. But, but like, think of like thousands of people passed him in the subway mm -hmm. and, and nobody recognized him. And a few people tossed in a few dollars and a couple people stopped to listen for a minute. But mm -hmm. No one appreciated uh, who he really was, right. you know? Right. Yeah. But God does. God does appreciate who you really are. Yes. And the reality of who you are, whether or not, whether you realize it or not, mm -hmm. or anyone else realizes it or not, is um, you are, as the Bible says, made in the image and likeness of God. And I think one of the joys of being on either end of being known and knowing, like noticing others and being noticed by others, is there's joy. Like, I think that's the wine. It's like mm -hmm. all of a sudden, 
the little things about, we were just talking with our friends who drop by, for instance, the little things that we're going on in our lives and in their lives, and those things matter. And that's what makes friendship real. There are sometimes really, really, really big things, you know. Um, a mutual friend was just engaged. That's a really big thing in, the, in, the, in their lives, was the, that couple. Uh, it's great, wonderful. But the little things matter in a way just as much. And all the big things are made up of a bunch of little things, like mentioning a couple being engaged, um, like a wedding. A wedding, we had, our son was married last summer. Um, there was a bunch of little things. One of the best things actually that happened was we went two days before the wedding and uh, Thursday night and all day Friday, we were at um, my our daughter-in-law's place. They had the wedding outside in the big tent. And we just like spent hours with her family paying attention to all kinds of little details for the celebration of the wedding on the Saturday. And what was interesting about that is looking back on it, it was actually really, really hot and kind of uncomfortable. But looking back on it, it was a very kind of neat bonding experience with um, her parents, her sisters, her brother, obviously Michael and Emily themselves, uh, and, and, and for our, our, our other kids as well. It's like, it actually kind of brought, it literally brought us together, literally. And all those little details, so for instance, I was responsible for the s'mores table. So I, I like, I designed and crafted the s'mores table with the materials I was given. You know, like who cares? Did anyone have s'mores? Probably if you did, I don't know. But there was so many little details and they all matter because the whole effect was like, this really, this was a big deal for our two families. This is just an example, right? Yeah. There's one example from my life from a few months ago. All the little details do matter. And it's not just about weddings and big, big events. It's, it's so many, so many little things that people, people love to be noticed and love to notice. And you need to know how to do that in the right way for each. Like some people actually don't like too much attention. I know that, but the right kind of attention and you get to know people and the kinds of things that, that give them, give them a sense of, of being cared for and mattering. That's, that's the wine. I think that's the wine. I think you should close with some prayer. Sure. God, our heavenly father, there's so many little things that matter in our lives, like buying groceries, like meeting friends, like looking after our families, looking after ourselves. Give us a heart like Mary, the mother of your son, Jesus, attuned to others as well, especially those who feel like they've run out of joy, they run out of wine that you want them to have. Help us to, to uh, reach out, to in, engage and encounter those who are struggling right now or those who are feeling like they're at a dead end. Give us hearts on fire with your love so that your love may come into every situation that we're part of. Give us the strength and the joy that we need because we're struggling too at times. We pray all these things in the name of your gracious and loving Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Charles. And thank you for joining us tonight on Thursday Night Appetizer. And we hope that you will uh, join us again next week. Don't forget the groceries. Don't forget the groceries. Bye, everybody.